Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. A little over two weeks ago, on the morning of July 16, my beautiful wife, Kristen Griff, passed away. Kristen was a special soul who lit up everywhere she went, and her vibrant and caring soul brought clarity, comfort and joy to all that she touched. She was the most beautiful, loving wife and best friend. My family and friends are all richer for having known her and absolutely devastated for having lost her. Cancer slowly took away her life over a four year period after she found a small lump in her right breast. She had thought that she would easily make it into her 90s just like her grandmother did. That hope was soon dashed after a biopsy showed her cancer's KI67 rate, the rate it progresses, was through the roof. Its aggressiveness resulted in her cancer almost tripling in size in just three weeks. In October 2017, surgeon Devendra Sagara operated on, on her at St Vincent's Private Hospital in Sydney. Chemotherapy drugs were administered in Adelaide the following month. But the chemo had to stop after just three sessions. It was impacting her lungs and causing significant scarring. Kristen was in a difficult place. Chemo only kills cancer cells that are dividing at the time. Dormant cells are not killed. But continuing chemo would further impair her general ability to survive. In early 2018, we met in Sydney with Devendra and oncologist Elgene Lim, who recommended specific oral drugs, and Kristen continued to have six monthly scans. We were feeling positive that her cancer had been beaten until a scan in late 2019 raised concerns. Further scans and blood tests in early 2020 showed progression that required an urgent mastectomy and removal of more lymph nodes and surrounding tissue. Her KI67 rate was now over six times the normal rate. COVID restrictions meant I could not travel to Sydney to be with her for the operation. It was a horribly stressful time for both of us. We then decided to return to Adelaide for the operation, but surgery limitations meant we could only remove the lymph nodes and upper armpit segments. And COVID restrictions meant I couldn't even go to the hospital to be with her. All I could do was find a spot where I could park and look up at a window as we spoke via our mobiles. It was horrible, just horrible. Surgeon Jim Collius operated on her at St Andrews Hospital and Kristen subsequently undertook radiation therapy and oral drugs proposed by her Adelaide oncologist, Ken Pippen. 2020 was a blur of scans, blood tests and drug changes. There was also a close call with a sepsis infection where we didn't think that she was going to pull through. By November last year, the cancer had spread throughout her spine and pelvis, her lumbar, her thoracic system and suspected incursion in other places. Oral drugs, letrozole, pavocyclin and pain medication continued, including a period where CBD oil was an absolute lifesaver for her. And like many with aggressive cancers, we went on the lookout for drug trials and found one that was particularly promising. Trial doctor Mina Okura arranged for new scans and told Kristen to go off her current drugs, which she did, and she immediately felt the best that she had actually felt for years. She looked great, had vitality again, was smiling, even singing. It was truly beautiful to see, but it didn't last long. Scans showed degree disease progression. This meant she was no longer eligible for the trial. You must be stable or in remission to qualify for trials. Something that I was not aware of until that point. And how wrong and how gut-wrenching was that? This left us with a choice. Stay off everything with Kristen feeling great for the first time in years or go back on drugs that were clearly having no effect. Adelaide oncologist Ken Pittman suggested trying anastrozole instead of letrozole. Immediately after taking anastrozole, Kristen had incredible pain. Hot sweats was the worst she had ever been in her life, all after taking one tiny pill. Did the cancer rebel against this anti-cancer drug and massively fight back? I think it did. From then on, everything went downhill. Her pain medication had to go up and up. Further scans in April this year showed her bone system and liver lit up like a Christmas tree. A liver biopsy took place at Calvary Hospital, North Adelaide, 
But incredibly, that was screwed up. They missed getting a sample of what turned out to be a very cancerous liver. This was not the only frustrating part of that experience. Kristen experienced excruciating pain during and after the biopsy, but the nursing staff, those at the St. Helens Ward of Calvary Hospital North Adelaide on the day, showed a total lack of interest. Kristen was screaming in pain, but the nurse just walked away. Buzzers were continually pressed. No one came. I raced out to the nurse's station and called for help. Not one of the nurses stationed there responded. They were busy chatting amongst themselves while my wife was in agony. The head nurse said our nurse was busy and would just have to wait until she came back. Totally gobsmacking. Someone could have been dying, but nobody would lift a finger because it wasn't part of their patch. What a disgusting culture, if that is the culture. We went back to that hospital on two other occasions, once for a blood transfusion where Kristen was forgotten about for the first hour, and the other for an overnight stay, and we vowed never again to visit that place. Our experience of the emergency department in the new Adelaide Calvary Hospital was, however, very different and excellent. But doctors tell me they just want the easy, profitable business. Cancer doctors do not have admitting rights. Since the botched biopsy, Kristen experienced frequent vomiting and major pain, both continuing for many weeks. She had further scans at Jones and Partners at Corrada Park. One required radioactive dye to be injected. The technician missed and injected the dye into her arm, which caused massive swelling, more significant pain over many weeks and poor imaging, another distressing experience. We met with oncologist Ken Pittman to discuss these scans and from that point on, he effectively took us off his books and referred us to a palliative care provider. We were obviously at the end of this journey. The palliative care team told us Kristen had, as they say, short weeks to live. That knocked us terribly. Up until then, Kristen was still hoping for a miracle, but it was not to be. But when Kristen arrived at Laurel Palliative Care Hospice, our stress levels dropped by 90%. Warm, welcoming nursing staff, beautiful facilities, doctors and support staff who genuinely cared we were finally at a place that responded to what the patient needed. Over the next two weeks, Kristen's health improved. She came home for almost three weeks with our DNS support, which meant that she could be with me and our youngest daughter who had just returned from Victoria. On July 10, everything went downhill. An ambulance took Kristen back to Laurel Hospice. She was very well cared for for her remaining days and she died holding my hand around 8 a.m. 16 July. Her last 30 minutes of life was a very emotional experience, which I will talk about another time. Kristen was a beautiful soul who went through much unnecessary pain and distress during her four years of living with cancer. Her medical experiences in the main weren't great, which I will outline another time. But her palliative care experience at Laurel Hospice was truly beautiful. She asked me to read her final words at her funeral and they sum up the type of person she is. And I quote, each of you has gifted my life with love and learning and I'm deeply grateful to you all for including me in your life. It was the greatest privilege to love and be loved and to be given the gift of raising kids who are wonderful humans doing good things within their own lives. When you leave today, step out and lift your head. Inhale deeply. Love and a good life await you. Nourish yourself daily with nature's presence through all the seasons of renewal." End of quote. Beautiful Kristen, thank you for being a part of my life and that of others who are fortunate to have known you. You will remain in our hearts forever. Thank you, Senator Griff. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.